that uh, talking about uh, uh, simply trying to fine tune what we already have is, uh, is, uh, is a license for disaster. It's going to happen to us again and again. And I was asked the question earlier, that was our failure to respond decisively to Pan Am 103? Do you think that that probably gave someone the, the idea that maybe they could strike here us, at us here in the United States without fear of, uh, of retribution? And I, and I have to believe our record's not very good. So I would just simply urge this committee to maybe do as a uh, uh, senator I admired very greatly when I worked for Senator Symington here, uh, Senator Fulbright, who said we had to think unthinkable thoughts. Sometimes the problem is such that we have to move beyond the incremental and, and really take decisive steps. And then I don't think we'll have the problem with frustration building that's a, that we might build a reaction against Arab Americans or we might have all these other things if the system could be shown to be working more effectively. So with that, I thank you again. Thank you. And Dr. Kupperman, for my question, you get the last word. Thank you. Uh, I, I agree with everything that, that you suggested, but I'd go further. Uh, we may very w well end up with an information superhighway in the Clinton sense, with uh, new networks that are going to be the gov govern our, our economic livelihood and, and how we function as a country. Uh, we're going to need to protect those, uh, those information, information highways. We're going to have to protect key, uh, uh, key nodes of the, uh, of the electrical power grid. You don't want to end up with glaring vulnerabilities that just take arbitrarily small efforts to just destroy them, and whose, whose loss could be just, just virtually irreparable. The costs are overwhelming, and we need to do a cost-effectiveness analysis, and we need to, to begin to, to think the unthinkable. Zoli, you get the last... You get the last word. Well, thank you very much. I, I tell you, it's been a fascinating day and um, extremely interesting. I want to salute you again, Mr. Chairman, on having these hearings. But let me, um, I've only uh, read these cursorily, but let me um, mention, I appreciate what Mr. Jenkins said in his last paragraph of the statement, because I do think there is a temptation here to perhaps flail around and then maybe try to cut off immigration, legal, or do some draconian thing to stop it. Uh, from the illegal standpoint. So even as we deplore and denounce what went on in New York and what went on in Langley, Virginia, or wherever, I think we have to be careful not to lapse into association laws and to try to enact uh, responses that way. So I, I think it's, it's useful that you had that paragraph in there. Um, a couple of very quick things. I think one of you mentioned a moment ago about planting ideas in the mind. This sort of thing could have, uh, perhaps Dr. Livingstone did. And I'm just curious, having gone through your statement, whether you feel comfortable having done the monograph, the poor man's atomic bomb, the monograph, American Bhopal, in which you, I never even heard of this location in some kind of a refinery where I now know I can do certain things which would have devastating results. I didn't know it until about five minutes ago. Do you feel awkward about that at the same time denouncing these manuals that you call uh, mayhem manuals? Well, it's a good question, one I've obviously thought a lot about. Um, we were encouraged to do the poor man's atomic bomb by Senator Goldwater and Senator uh, Tower, then chairman of the Armed Services Committee, as a way of, and, and the government did declassify some information that had heretofore been classified, mm -hmm. so that we could focus on the, the threat, because no one was looking at it. You have to remember that I was criticized at the time for saying that Iraq was trying to build chemical weapons. And with that type of uh, short-sightedness by some in this country, it was necessary that it, we, we have to get people's attention and, and we have to try to do it responsibly. And that's really the business that I'm in and I, and I try to be responsible, leave out enough that uh, we don't give a, t a total blueprint, but we do have to alert Congress and the media and others to, uh, to these vulnerabilities that Bob Kupperman and, and others have focused on. Well, I appreciate that. It, it, it's, um, it causes me a certain quivering sensation from time to time to read these things because it, it could, for those among us, perhaps, give ideas that they would never have had before. I, for one, never even heard of what you refer to in here. But it's, um, I guess, uh, one, one, one question, too, and that is, um, 
With regard to asylum laws, we talked about earlier today about the need to, or would there be a need in view of the chart that uh, Director Sessions put in here, which shows that there's only been 100 incidents over the last 12 or 13 years, and I believe you said maybe one of them that was directly attributable to international terrorism. The others were domestic versions of terrorism. Um, because of that fairly small guilt quotient of people who are not already here, or people who have t contact uh, to uh, foreign bosses, so to speak, uh, would changing the asylum laws, Dr. Kupperman, and working with would that change anything? Would that help in I, I, stemming I, terrorism? Would it uh, be of any? I, I, I'm really in favor of being fairly open, but uh, mm -hmm. having a mechanism whereby, uh, if we find that people are uh, not behaving themselves, to get rid of them, to get rid of them quickly. Mr. Jenkins. Well, I mean, uh, you, you can see, even between the three of us, there are divergences, although yeah. we are, we're, we're good friends about this. One, uh, Bob Kupperman talking about reducing vulnerabilities through the protection of vital systems, which is important. Neil Livingston talking about a more muscular response to deter future uh, attacks on the United States. And of the three, I tend to be the most phlegmatic in terms of, of being very, very cautious about uh, about new legislation, about further laws limiting things. Uh, I, don't, I don't think we can go too far in, in the direction of, of prevention. Uh, I tend to be very skeptical of doing things because something must be seen to be done. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and therefore, uh, I'm afraid that I fall into the category of those who say, well, if you can streamline something or if you can make it for, for those that, that do cross a line, tinkering with the system, I'm willing to go along with that. I don't see that. that you and Dr. Kupperman are too far off, but I would like to hear from Mr. Livingston because he says, let people in, but kick them out if they do it wrong. And you say here, if they're preaching or practicing violence, get rid of them in a hurry. I, and so long as you can make those subtle distinctions of what constitutes preaching violence and if that's a bad thing or practicing violence, if that's a bad thing. But uh, Mr. Livingston, now I have one last question, Mr. Chairman, and I'm finished. Yes. Well, um, in res the chairman... Basically about asylum laws, sure. immigration laws. As you notice, I, I only said that we need to make our borders more secure, and, and the chairman had raised the issue earlier, and I thought uh, rightly so on uh, uh, the problem that we have right now in terms of, uh, of what we might call bad actors here, and the, the, the need to basically be able to expel them from the United States, particularly if they're here illegally to begin with. Mm -hmm. We uh, are, they have been incorrectly admitted to the United States. I can't tell you that I, it's the most asked question I have been asked by uh, reporters and individuals from across the country was how do these guys get here anyway? And I don't think they're picking out the ordinary uh, immigrant or uh, citizen from those countries. They're just saying these guys look like bad folks. They came here illegally or through some oversight, why did it take so long to get them out of the country? And I think that's something that Congress could look at, is maybe finding some way to expedite uh, our ability to expel at least the, 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 the bad actors right. so that they don't taint the whole uh, group and of immigrants, under, under, too. Undergirding that, of course, is recognition of the fact, looking at the charts, if they're accurate, we have very, very few instances in truth over the years of people who are bad actors who fall in that asylum category who have been wandering around here for a while. My last question, Mr. Chairman, is this, and is it not, is, uh, Dr. Kupperman talked about the, the superhighway of what's going to connect this world together in the new era, and we talk about jet transportation and communications and on and on. The argument is made about illegal entry from Mexico. It says you never will stop that so long as you have the disparity of income at the border and this 2,000-mile border. Until you solve the problems at home, expect people to try to come in here. Is it not fair to say that given what we have in America, the desire to have open borders and openness and, and magnanimity about people, that we'll never stop this unless we stop the problems, which are for the most part abroad, that produce these kinds of frustrations? And, would it not be, let me just ask brief comments, if we were to try to do something and do it correctly, even-handedly in the Middle East, would that not solve some of the problems or do something in what was formerly Yugoslavia that's even-handed and 
intelligent? Wouldn't that solve our problem better than trying to uh, erect barriers or trying to ferret out the bad people? Quick answers with you. Sir? The answer is obviously maybe. Maybe. <laughs> obviously maybe. <laughs> but I, I would disagree strongly that we can uh, reason with some of these people. I mean, uh, the fact is, and I wish I could sit with you and go over profiles of some of the people. I, 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 there are hair-curling stories, and uh, the kind of people that can get off a plane at Israel's Lod Airport and open up on a, the passengers with uh, automatic weapons and grenades and so on. Uh, I'm not sure that you can sit down and solve their problems. And I'll, I'll make one other point that we must keep an orderly international system. That's why we have the UN. That's why we can solve our, uh, our problems when we can talk to each other. If we have to be forced to talk to each other at the point of a gun or through some type of coercion or intimidation, then I don't think that we can really ever solve those problems. It only drives us further apart. So I, I think we, we, we have to reject the notion that we can somehow solve the problem in Northern Ireland with a peace negotiator overnight or send someone to the Middle East who's going to produce peace where they haven't had peace in uh, centuries. Mr. Jacobs. I, I used to like to think that rational even-handedness would solve the problems of the world. Um, I am less convinced uh, that uh, what we would do uh, would necessarily be seen by the antagonists as rational and even-handed, um, and, and therefore I'm somewhat less sanguine about our ability to uh, well, Thank you very to much. Excellent those. panel. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, thank you. And, uh, I think we're ready to conclude. I first want to thank our panelists for their, not only their patience, but much more important, their excellent answers. I want to thank my colleagues for staying and all of my colleagues who came. I think we had a very interesting discussion that shows you that this is not an easy issue and uh, we're going to have a lot to grapple with and deal with. Um, finally, I'd like to thank all the people who worked so hard on this hearing. My staff, uh, our subcommittee staff, did a fabulous job, Andy Foy's and uh, the rest of his crew over here, uh, as well as uh, Lyle Nirenberg representing the minority. And finally, I want to thank, I always try to thank our stenographer who sits there all day and works diligently and hard. So today we have John Hundley. Thank you very much Lisa as well. And um, Lisa and, and Lisa and Rachel and uh, Paul and Gabriel and everybody else who did a good job. Hearing's adjourned.